In this lecture of Analytics for Business and Economics, we're going to continue what we started in lecture 18 with estimating regression. And we've estimated a regression model, and now we need to evaluate that model. And we're going to talk about model evaluation. And I think this is really one of the most important steps in any kind of um, statistical analysis is once you've created a model, then test it to make sure it's going to work. All right, so let's. Um, dive right in. Okay, so we are talking about model evaluation. Same setup as always. We have lecture notes on the left-hand side, our studio cloud on the um, right-hand side. We've already, in the previous lecture, estimated this model. All right, so we come up here and we have a model where we have the um, dan.grump is our dependent variable, so how grumpy poor Dan is, and then how much sleep Dan gets, and how much sleep Dan's new baby gets. This is all found in the parenthood data frame, which can be loaded from right here. And this follows is following along with the example in our textbook. So let's dig right in, and we will continue to look at the um, idea of, well, okay, how do we go about evaluating um, the basically the, whether or not the validity of the model? And so when we do that, we're going to basically take a step back and say, well, what are the basic assumptions of linear regression? So I'm not going to go through all of them today because some of them get a little bit mathematical, but I'm going to go through some of the very Im uh, most important ones and then you may take a follow-on class, say in a course in econometrics or whatnot, where you would, would dive a little bit deeper and have an even deeper understanding of um, uh, the basis for um, ordinary least squares or linear regression being what we call blue or best the best linear unbiased estimator. All right, so one of the very first things we want to do once we have a model, and actually, I'm going to take a step back because some of our model checking really should have happened even before we ever ran a model. Okay, some of the things like looking at the data, doing the pairs plot of the data to get a sense of how the data is working. See, are there outliers? Are there, um, is there any um, skew to the data? Does, um, do the relationships that we see seem to be linear in nature? We should also think about whether or not the theoretical relationship between the data is linear or not. Because the first thing about a linear model is your data needs to be, your relationship has to be linear for a linear model to make sense. So take for an example, let's say we want to talk about something like advertising. All right, so I have a product and I want to know how much money I should spend on advertising. And so I do some estimation and I see that there's a relationship between the amount of money I spend on advertising and sales. But economic theory tells me that can't be linear, right? Because if I spend $10 on advertising, okay, I'm going to get a certain marginal increase for that $10. But if I spend another $10, it doesn't mean I'm going to get the same amount. And another $10 doesn't mean I'm going to get the same amount. In fact, economic theory tells us that amount will be diminishing, right? That will hit a point of diminishing returns, right? And so it'll take more and more and more um, advertising spending to get that next sale. And so what we would expect is a nonlinear relationship, in which case we need to do something about that. Now, figuring out exactly what to do about that is beyond the scope of um, this particular course. But it's very important to note that, you know, a lot of our model checking happens before we ever even run a model. Just think about the data. What's the relationship? How should it be? Um, and oftentimes, even if you're not the statistician on board, you might be a manager involved and you may actually know the situation and know the data better than the consultant that you hire comes in. Almost certainly you do. And so some of that information can be very, very valuable. All right, but let's, let's start and look at some of the basic things once we have the linear regression that we ought to check right off the bat. Well, one of the assumptions that we have for linear regression 
is that the norm that the residuals right remember what we talked about last time what those residuals are okay the residuals are normally distributed all right so we need to check that and I'm going to go through a couple of different ways of checking. I think like we, we have like three different ways we can check those residuals. It's all the same as what we studied when we looked at analysis of variance. Because remember, in the inside the computer, the actual mathematical algorithm to calculate all this stuff is exactly the same between linear model and um, AOV. In fact, it's it's easy to see, it's easy to set up an analysis of variance just using the linear model. Right, just using linear regression. It's the same math. So we're going to basically be checking same kinds of things. Well, my first choice in how to check whether or not a variable is normally distributed or not is just plot the histogram. All right, it's simple, it's easy, um, it's not very glamorous, but it's really important because it does a couple of things. First of all, normality of the residuals for linear regression is not that important all right linear regression is highly robust to the residuals not being perfectly normally distributed all right so if we look at the histogram of the residuals from our model that's fine all right it's a little bit fat in the middle that might be because my uh, the bins in my histogram are a little wide i don't know but it basically makes you know it makes a mountain and that's fine. It looks just fine. It should just make that kind of mountain, right? As easy peasy. What you don't want to see is really, really wacko, weird things like maybe two humps or a lot of skew or an outlier or something like that in this data that will show up that might very well, you might very well see in this histogram. And you say, huh, well, the fact that it's not normal is not the end of the world, but maybe that's indicative of something else maybe it's showing you that there's some other problem you know deeper in the model that you need to go and have a little bit of a look at and so that's why i really love just looking at a histogram it's going to tell you things in ways that i don't necessarily think the other methods of looking at the residuals normality are going to and the easiest way is just to use the base r command hist h-i-s-t that's for histogram and then there's really two ways that we can get at the residuals in our model. So if I come up here and I call this this double model residual or regression one in the in this lecture right there. Okay, I shouldn't have done that. That's kind of a typo. That should be two. So it's going to be confusing the whole way. So I'm just going to stay consistent with the first lecture. We're going to call it regression two because it's right there already. And so I'm just going to type in regression two. Really doesn't matter. Regression two. And then I'm going to hit the dollar sign. And I'm going to come down here to where it says residuals. And boom, there's residuals. That gets it for you. That's one way to do it. All right, it's a little skinny here. It looks better rendered out, but you know that's OK. Another way to do this is there's actually a function called residuals. So I can do H-I-S-T, then I'm gonna do open parentheses. And I hate doing nested functions because it makes it hard to keep track of the parentheses. So I'm just gonna hit return. Notice how R Studio put my open parentheses there and then brought my closed parentheses clear down here. So now I can put arguments in and I'm gonna type in residuals. All right, right there from the stats package, open parentheses and regression one, just my regression model. And I just happen to call it, and I'm sorry, it's regression two. I'm gonna make that mistake. It's gonna be confusing the whole way through. Sorry about that. But regression, E S S I O N um, and dot two. And it doesn't matter because regression one and regression two are actually really, really close to one another because remember this variable on, baby.sleep is so close to zero, it basically doesn't matter. Um, and I can do that, boom, I get exactly the same thing. All right. Two different ways. Remember, remember the thing about R is it always gives you 40 different hammers when what you need is a screwdriver. Um, there's always more than one way to do everything. 
So there's there's my first check of normality, and it looks fine. I don't see any problems. Trust me, if there's a problem with this graph, you'll see it. You'll know it. It'll just be weird. The next thing we can do is we can do the Shapiro test. Now remember the Shapiro test, that's a part of the car package. All right, so companion for applied regression is what car is. And we loaded that earlier to um, earlier in the previous lecture. So I'm just going to paste this in. I'm going to do Shapiro.test. And then here I need to pass it the residuals. All right, and run that. And this is OK. It gives me a W statistic that's that with a p-value that's really, really high. So I fail to reject the null hypothesis that the, the um, residuals are normally distributed. Now, you could argue that maybe the null and the alternative hypotheses there are kind of reversed um, from what we would like to do because we want to prove that they're normal, not prove that they're not normal. So we're kind of giving the benefit of the doubt in the wrong direction, maybe. I don't know. Um, I know it's not trivial to switch around those um, null and alternative hypotheses. Um, so to be perfectly honest, I still like just looking at the histogram better. Um, um, it's, it's a fine test. It gets used. Um, the other thing we can do is we can also do, I didn't put it in the lecture notes, but we can do the QQ plot. Um, so there's this function QQ norm. Okay, and we can give it, um, I believe what we want to do, I think all we have to do is give it regression. Oops, that didn't work. Oh, it doesn't want that. It wants the residuals. And you're right, regression two, this should also have been regression two. So there we go. It doesn't change very much. There we go. There's my QQ norm plot. Yeah, so those dots basically should be in a straight line. And the closer to a straight line, the better. But um, the more normal they are. Here, it does not, it, this indicates the data is normally distributed. Um, so that's another way of looking at it. Um, I think it's a little harder to interpret than just the, the um, histogram. So, you know, there you go. The next thing, checking linearity. All right, so like I said before, before we even started estimating a model, we should be starting to think about these linearity checks. You know, is there a theoretical reason why this would not be a linear relationship, right? You know, if you just flat know there's a, there's a reason why it shouldn't be. Um, number of years experience and ability and, and quality of a driver. Okay, well, that's clearly going to be a nonlinear thing. Because as, as experience goes, it's gonna, you're going to get better and better and better and better, right? And then plateau. And then eventually, the fact that you have more experience starts to, to work against you because you, you have your age makes you less able to drive a car. And so your ability to drive declines, right? And so it goes up and then it comes back down. That's something I would say we'd call it kind of like a quadratic relationship where you know, it goes up and down like a parabola. All right. There's clearly theoretical reason why I would think there is a nonlinear relationship there. Um, so there I would say, okay, I've got to do something to deal with that if I want to use a, a linear model on it. Other, other things that we can do are some basic scatter plots, though I will say this. One of the problems we run into trying to do scatter plots between data on the front end of estimating the model is really that idea that curse of dimensionality. Let's say you have four or five explanatory variables. Well, it starts to you start to end up with a lot of plots really, really quickly. And you're always only looking at two variables at a time, which can also be a little bit deceiving. So we de definitely need to do some checks of linearity on the back end. One of the things is the, the individual scatter plots. So these are the two scatter plots of Dan sleep and baby sleep versus Dan.grump. 
Now, the, both of these scatter plots were in our pairs plot, weren't they? Um, this just makes them a little bit bigger. And so let me show you how I did this. Um, we're going to use the plot function, and I'm just going to give it a formula. Dan.grump as a function of, all right, or explain by Dan.sleep and baby.sleep. Get the baby, baby uh, the data from parenthood, and what it's going to do is it's going to spit out two plots just like this. And so I can do that. I'll come over here, get an R plot, and we'll just, you know, frankly, I can just copy this. And really, we can look at it one step at a time. We have the formula, we have our data, and all that's going to do is give me two plots. They're not very cool here because it's a little bit scrunched, but um, there, you know, we can we could deal with that. When we knit it, it won't be so scrunched. Okay. So, and by knit, I mean click this button up here to turn it into your final report. So either a Word document, or in the case of these notes, my lecture notes, an HTML document. All right, so that's the first thing we can do for linearity. The next thing that we can do that actually is, is, is kind of nice, because what we can do is we can look at the fitted versus actual plot, all right, and or the actual versus fitted plot. In other words, we're going to take and we're going to put the actual values of Dan's grumpiness on the vertical axis and the fitted values on the horizontal axis. Now you could flip flop the axis, that's fine, but nobody does it and I don't know, and it's hard for me to read because I always do it this way. So, I mean, traditionally, and I think more standard practice would be to put the fitted values on the X axis and the actual values on the Y axis. And then we can add a line in here. And basically what this line is going to do is it's going to start at zero, zero and increase with a rope of, uh, with a slope of one. All right. So everywhere on this line is basically the line Y equals X. So here, if it's on the line, that means the actual value equals the fitted value. If it's off the line, that means they don't, all right? And what do you want to see? You want to see the dots follow that line in a band. And I like to say you think about it like butter spread over bread, okay? You know, I'm spreading my butter over my toast. I don't want big glops of butter, and I don't want big spots of dry bread. I want it evenly spread right across there. All right, or another way to think about it, if you've ever thought of, you know, like spray paint, you know, I want to spray paint right up along this line and I want a nice even coverage, right? Same kind of thing. And here, this is like basically perfect. If we had some kind of nonlinearity, um, oftentimes it will present as the dots like veering off. You'll see some kind of nonlinear relationship between them. It'll look weird. What's really cool about this is I only have one plot. No matter how many dependent, I'm sorry, independent variables I have, I still only have this one plot. It summarizes it all down. Um, and so it's a good way to diagnose that there is a problem. Whether or not it actually tells you where that problem is, no, not really. You'll have to dig more to find out. But at least, you know, you know what, what does it say? Knowing you have a problem is, well, the first step. Exactly. So um, to do that, let me let me just go through this really quick. We're going to use the base, just base R, so plot command. And then what we're going to do is we're going to get the actual values. There's a couple of different ways to do this, but you know this seems to be the most straightforward. Just go right straight to the source. Parenthood, dollar sign, and we want dan.grump. And now we're going to do a tilde because we want it as opposed to, so we want a scatter plot against these two. And then we have to go to our regression model. And here we want regression two, dollar sign, and we want residuals, or I'm sorry, no, fitted values. We'll do the residuals later. Okay, and I can run this. All right, this is, doesn't look very good. The next thing I can do is let's add that that line to it, so the place where y equals x. And the easiest way to do that is just use the function a b line and open parentheses. 
there's more than one way to do this, but if I do A equals, don't ask me why A, it's not the most um, mnemonic, but that's okay, 0, comma 1. So I want an intercept of 0 and a slope of 1. Oops. Oh, not a P line, a B line. So it's a line through point A and point B. There we go. There's my there's my line. Just like just like over here. Okay. If you want to get really extra fancy. There you go. COL for color. Again, not the most mnemonic, but there we are. All right, next. What we can do, what we want to do is we need a homogeneity of variance. So just like in um, our, our ANOVA section chapter, where we needed homogeneity of variance, we need the same thing here. Although I will say this, your textbook uses the term homogeneity of variance. Oftentimes I will see you know, kind of the double negative, well, not quite double negative, but almost a double negative of the assumption of no heteroscedasticity. In other words, homoscedasticity means the spread is even or the same. Homo meaning same, scedasticity meaning spreadity outediness. All right, so that means this, that would be the same spreadity outediness. Heteroscedasticity means different spreadity outediness. All right, and so um, we need homogeneous variance or homoscedasticity of the residuals. Um, and that's how we're going to check this. And that one of the best ways to do this, and frankly, I think one of the best um, evaluation charts or, or, or things that you can do to evaluate a model um, is look at something called the residuals versus fit plot. All right. So essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my residuals. They're going to go on the y-axis and the fitted values, those y-hats, are going to go on the x-axis. And we're going to plot them. And what's nice about this is you can do this plot for basically any model out there. If there is a y and a y hat, if there's a, a dependent variable and then a prediction of that dependent variable, well, I can take the difference between the two and get a residual. So I can do a residuals versus fitted values plot. And it always has the same interpretation. Basically, what we want to see is kind of like static. So basically, think of butter spread on toast where the toast is the, you know, the, the zero line. So you want it to be a straight band, no slope, no shape, just kind of static, if you will. Because the idea is there shouldn't be any information left in those residuals if we're doing our job right in terms of um, modeling the relationship between those data. If there is, that means something's not right with our model. We're leaving information on the table, so to speak. And so we probably want to figure out a way to do it better. Um, and so I really like this plot because oftentimes you'll see something. You know, nonlinearity will show up as a you know kind of a wave or some kind of nonlinear pattern in these these dots. I don't have it here, but if you see it, you'll know it. Um, uh, other things like heteroscedasticity, these dots might be narrow here and wide at this end, or the other way around. They make kind of like a funnel, all right? Um, sometimes they'll make like a cornucopia shape. If they make that kind of cornucopia shape where they're narrow up here and they have a, 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 you know, an arc to them and they get wide over here, well, then you got all kinds of things going on. You might have serial correlation. You might have heteroscedasticity. You might have all kinds of things going on Basically, it doesn't matter if you know exactly what it is. If you make this plot and it looks like that, well, then there's something going on with the model. And whoever did it and is presenting that information to you had better have an explanation of what they're doing about it. 
all right? Not all of them are absolutely insurmountable, but you certainly have a right to say, hey, what's going on with this? Um, and they should have an answer. So let's go ahead and we're going to do this one. Um, so essentially, we're going to use the plot function again, only this time we're going to give it the regression object. Remember, this is we use the LM function and just save the results to regression2. Now, if I do this just, just like this, plot regression.2, I'm going to get several different plots. All right. The first one is the residuals versus fit plot that I want. So I'm going to say I don't want all of these. You know, like the second one is the QQ residuals plot, which is kind of nice to have. Then we have things like this one, it does some scaling to it. And we're not going to go through all of these. They're beyond the scope of this particular class. What we really need is this first one. So we're going to just come in here and we're going to use the argument which, no, W-H-I-C-H, -H, equals one. Which one? The first one. And we're going to run that. And there we go. There's our residual versus fit plot. I don't really like how light the, the zero axis is, so I like to just put in another line. All right, so an A, B line. And here I want a horizontal line, so it's H, and that equals zero. So I want a horizontal line at zero. Boom. I think that just makes it a little easier to see. I like that in this plot because zero is, that's what you're looking at. You want the dots to be around zero. The closer they are to zero, the closer, um, and basically the lower your, your amount of residual variation is. The other thing I really like about this, um, the plot in the base R, the residual versus fit plot, is it includes this kind of nonlinear fit, best fit thing that's on here. It's, it's not really important how it comes up with that, but it is it does make for a nice guideline. Basically, you want to see that red line be very close to the zero axis. So basically, the way I've drawn this, if the red line is really close to that black line, then the things are good. Um, if not, then things are less so, right? Now, it's possible, like if you have no nonlinearity whatsoever, really, really hyperlinear relationship, but you just have heteroscedasticity to just have a funnel here, such that this red line and the black line do overlap one another, but you still have heteroscedasticity, you would still see that because the dots would make a funnel instead of a nice evenly spaced band across the, across the chart. All right, essentially, you don't want to see any pattern in these dots. If you see pattern, that's indicative of a problem. Okay, now, if you do see pattern in this one, if you see something going on, it can be helpful to go ahead and plot the residuals versus each one of the independent variables. There should be no correlation between the residuals and a dependent variable. So if there's any pattern in this, that means there's a problem with your model. Um, I like to look at this one first because it can get pretty tedious looking at all of these plots, especially if you have several um, um, independent variables. But this one kind of encapsulates them all into one. Um, but see, there you go. And in both of these cases, so this case is the fitted values. That's fine. Um, for Dan.sleep, there's clearly no problems whatsoever. For baby sleep, no problems whatsoever. Basically, the, the residuals in this model are perfect because they kind of come out of the textbook. The final thing we're going to do is we're going to use the brush pagan test to test for heteroscedasticity. All right, the student dies brush pagan test. So basically what that is, the robust variant of the brush pagan test. So this is kind of the, the uh, I would say, the, the most common, closest there is to a gold standard for testing for heteroscedasticity. Um, and basically our null hypothesis is no heteroscedasticity or 
the data is homoscedastic, although I very rarely hear everybody ever use that term. Um, nothing wrong with it, it's just I don't hear it very often. And so it's a part of the LM test package. This is a different kind of test. Um, let me let me get this package loading here real quick. All right, I'll run that. Um, so the normal kinds of packages that you're we're used to, uh, or the normal kinds of tests that you're used to, are um, I'm basically going to take a to find the distance between the hypothesized parameter and the the sample parameter in terms of standard errors, right? So I take the hypothesized minus what I observe from the data, divide that by the standard error, and that gives me a statistic that has a certain distribution. Well, in this case, it's a little bit different. It actually comes out of a constrained optimization problem, which if you've had some calculus, you know what that is. If you haven't, you don't. It doesn't matter. LM stands for Lagrange multiplier. Um, doesn't really, really matter, but that's why it's LM test. All right, and it's a part of the LM test package. And we're going to do BP test. All right, simple here. All right, and we need, it wants a formula. We don't need to give it a formula. We're just going to give it our regression object. Because the BP test is actually smart enough to look inside of there and find the formula for you. And then the the null you can see right here for or the default for studentized is true. We always want we want to make sure that I mean that's good. Just always make that true, uh, because this test the original version of this test required the residuals to be normally distributed. If they weren't, it didn't work. Um, this creates a robust variant of that such that it doesn't matter if they're normally distributed or not. In this case, they are, so it's not a big deal, but we always want to make sure that's true. And it's set there by default, so another way to do this would just be to get rid of the argument altogether. Notice the p-value is 0.7832. If I rerun this, exactly the same because it's leaving it as true. And so here's our test statistic. And we get a p-value of 0.78, and so we fail to reject the null hypothesis of no heteroscedasticity. There was a lot of negatives in that that sentence, so sorry about that. But basically, we find no problem. All right. Final little thing is to look for um, whether or not we have what's called multicollinearity. We can run into a problem if our independent variables, so in this case, dan.sleep and baby.sleep, are too highly correlated with one another. If they're too highly correlated with one another, basically what it means is they move together, and so it's very difficult for our linear model to figure out whether we should be, um, whether it's, dan.sleep or baby.sleep. So one of the reasons why baby.sleep might be insignificant is the fact that dan. it's correlated with dan.sleep, right? My only argument there is it's not that correlated. So when I think about um, um, multicollinearity, basically I want to look at this correlation coefficient. If the correlation between the two variables, the two independent variables, is more than 0.7, it kind of bears watching. And that's, or less than negative 0.7, so in absolute value terms. All right, distance from zero. The absolute value of that correlation coefficient is more than 0.7, it bears watching. If it's more than 0.9, you probably need to do something about it. Like, for example, if it's over 0.9, they're probably so highly correlated that it doesn't make sense to keep both variables in the model. So maybe you just drop one. Um, or if you don't want to drop one, you do some kind of other weird transformation that you think is OK. Um, what to do in that case is a little beyond the scope of this. But the um, basic thing is, if they are too highly correlated, it can cause problem. This is called multicollinearity, which means basically they're correlated with one another. 
um, and it can be an issue if it's too high. In this case, I don't think it probably is too bad. Um, I mean, you know, it's 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 a little bit high, but it's not it's not really that high. So um, we can use the pairs dot panels. We did that in the previous lecture, so I'm not going to repeat it here. You get this guy. I explained this in the previous lecture, so I'm not going to do it here. We can see the correlation between Dan sleep and baby dot sleep is 0.63, and we can see the scatter plot between the two of them. It does look like they have a linear relationship with one another, but it's not overly tight. It's not a very tight relationship. All right, so the next thing we can do is we can get a, pack, a, a function out of the cars package um, called VIF, and that's called that stands for the variance inflation factor. This is kind of my second choice. All right, so my first choice is to look at the pairs dot panel, look at the scatter plot, look at the, um, the correlation coefficient between the two, um, and, 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 uh, and look for collinearity that way. Um, if you want a little more, you know, sophisticated test, then we can look at something like a variance inflation factor. And so right here, I'm going to do the variance inflation factor. I need to do it on regression two because that's my one with multiple regression in it. Um, and it's in the car package, so we'll load that real quick. And we get these two numbers. Now, what do those numbers mean? I don't. Uh, we can talk about what variance inflation. Basically, when you have collinearity, it can make these standard errors of your um, coefficients overly big. It can inflate them, and so that's why we, we talk about that. But basically, if this number, and in this case, they're both the same because we only have two predictors. If we had more than two predictors, they wouldn't all be. They wouldn't both be the same. But um, essentially. If that number is greater than 10, you may have a problem with um, multicollinearity. All right, they, they may be too highly correlated with one another. So there you go. The final thing that we can do um, is use a package called JTools. I tend to like this package um, because one of the things it does is it gives a way to display the, you know, the regression model a little more neatly and I think a little nicer than the summary command that's built into R. So um, it also gives you access to a few other options for output that are important in my opinion. So a couple of things we can do. So JTools, so the that's just the package JTools. And it's basically designed for um, um, displaying regression output and, and in um, in a nice fashion. Uh, one thing that you might need, if you output to Microsoft Word, you may also have to install the Huxtable, H-U-X-T-A-B-L-E, H-U-X-T-A-B-L-E um, package. And because JTools relies on the Huxtable package, but doesn't always get installed properly when you do it, when you install just JTools. So it might be good practice just to put both of them there. And then finally, we're going to do our regression two in this case, and we're gonna set VIF or the variance inflation factor to true. And if we run that, here's our model output, um, which I think is a little nicer, but you know, you can, argue with me, whichever you like. Um, it tells us our observations, what our dependent variable is, the type of estimation. All right, so we had an OLS linear regression. All right, gives us our F stat, gives us our R squared and our adjusted R squared. Here's our coefficient table, just like, just like before when we use the summary function. It's just, I think, a little more nicely formatted. Yeah. Um, and here it's calculated the variance inflation factors. Um, so there you are. All right. Finally, checking for serial correlation. Serial correlation really only matters when there is an order to the data. All right. And that's probably not true. 
Um, there are probably types of, well, serial correlation, yeah, it, it, there, there's an order to a data. So essentially, other observations of the errors are correlated with one another. Right. I guess so. I, I guess it maybe it doesn't entirely matter that they're ordered, but the context that we're going to think of it in is: Does the order of the observation matter? If it does, that's a bit of a problem. Um, and so when we look at say time series data, which is data that's measured over time, this could be a real. This is a real issue. I mean, we we get this all the time because order clearly matters um, because their their progression over time. In this case, we actually, this data is kind of a time series because it's measured daily over 100 days. But one of the things that would be a real problem with our experiment is if the day of, if the, day of the experiment mattered, right? So for example, so here we have our residuals, okay? And that's a really nice way to just kind of collapse down all the issues with the model. Right. If our residuals, the spread or some kind of thing have pattern relative to the day in the experiment, that tells me we had something kind of contaminating our experimental design. All right. Um, you know, one example might be, you know, Dan got less sensitive to the baby's crying over the course of the experiment and was just able to sleep more or dan just got better at dealing with less sleep and so became less grumpy um, in the latter part all right if 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 we saw a pattern in here there's those are the kinds of things that we could see that would be a problem if we see pattern in a graph like this the thing is we don't see any pattern which is good all right so basically we have our residuals on our y-axis and we're going to have the day of the um the day of the experiment on the x-axis and we basically see no correlation between the day of the experiment and the residuals and that's a good thing right if we did it would be it could be an issue we might also like to go back and look at like for example the pairs panel and see here when we look at First of all, the correlation between day and Dan's grumpiness, 0 0.08, almost no correlation. So almost no relationship there. Um, baby sleep, almost no correlation. And Dan sleep, almost no correlation. I mean, so basically very, very close to zero in all cases. When we look at the scatter plots, it's just a big, psh, you know, if you remember the old TVs before digital with the analog, they had the white snow when they went, psh, when there was no signal. Um, that's kind of what we're, we're seeing here. Just just static and that's exactly what we want to see all right if there were a relationship between the day of the experiment i would be highly concerned with our experimental design so let's keep looking so that's one way to look at this the other way to talk about this is the um, brush godfried test for um, serial correlation and so you have to do a couple things to put in here um, so the brush godfried test is a part of the lm package so you need or LM test pa um, um, package. So you need to make sure LM test is loaded, and then we're gonna paste that in. So BG test, give it our regression equation or a regression model. All right, and then we have to give it how the data should be ordered by because serial correlation, you know, it's is this is this observation correlated with previous observations is kind of the way serial correlation works um you know is is does it matter you know what what some ordering does it matter right it doesn't have to necessarily be day or time it could be different types of orderings but basically we have to give it some ordering for it to look at and ordered by so we want to do by day because that's that's the the variable that gives our observations any kind of order. And if I run that, I end up with a high p-value, which means I fail to reject the null of no serial correlation. So, hey, awesome sauce. Um, I left the, um, the um, order, right? There's a couple of things in here. I just left them to by default. Um, and so this is up to one lag 
So there's there's a lot to uncover pack here that we just can't in this class. So um, I'm showing it to you because it's important for you to kind of know it's there, but realize I've not given you enough information to really understand what's going on. Um, and so if you need to do um, analysis on data like time series data or other data where there is a definite order to the data, um, you, you probably need to have more training um, or bring somebody in who understands and, and is, is an expert in time series analysis. All right, final thing to do is look for bad outliers. And this one, again, it's going to come right down to I want to plot the um, residuals right here and yeah that graph is ugly so we'll talk about that in a minute as a box plot that's all i want to do come right down here paste so we'll talk about this i give it the residuals so regression two for me um dollar sign residuals that she just gets those residuals and i just tell it do it horizontally instead of vertically. I don't know, for kicks and giggles. And it makes it horizontal. If I made this false, it'd make it vertical. That doesn't look as cool. So I'm going to make it true. And by the way, um, you can get away. You, it's, it's possible to use T and F for true and false, a capital T and a capital F for true and false. I've had some issues with that, so I prefer to write the full word out. Um, I think that's um, less prone to bugginess for unforeseen reasons. And we can see maybe there's a couple of outliers to the bottom, but there's at least one outlier to balance it to the top. The median is right here around zero. The um, edges of the boxes are a little off center, but not too, too bad. Um, basically, this looks fine. I don't see any issues with with residual with outliers. To see a really bad outlier, you know, I mean, if you saw one of these dots way, way out, you know, here, and really nothing to balance it on the other side, what you want to see is think of this as like a teeter totter where the the fulcrum is at zero. You really want this teeter totter to kind of be balanced. The other thing we can do, and this graph is kind of ugly. Um, you can, I actually have a version of this graph where I do it using a package called ggplot that looks a lot better. Um, but basically this is really hard to read, but um, I'm essentially saying there should not be too many residuals that are more than two standard errors of regression away from zero. And here they're not, they're fine. Okay, final subject is R squared, misunderstood, misused, and abused. All right, there is, I think this blog post, let me check it, make it sure. I'll open that in a new tab. Although I don't know. Let's see here, how to interpret R squared. Yeah, it's still here. This is a nice little blog post. I really suggest reading this um, because it does a nice job of talking about how to interpret R squared and what it is. Um, and you can see right here, this is a nice little graph. It's showing these, these little lines here represent the residuals. And it tells you how much less these residuals are going to be on average in, in percentage terms. But if I just guess the average for Y, right? If I just drew a horizontal line right here through. Um, all these dots, well, all the dots, the, these lines would be on average longer by how much, essentially. That's what, what R square is telling you. Um, and this is just a nice one that talks about some of the issues with R squared. So um, give that a read. It's, it's well worth it. And then let me go back here. And so I want to talk a little bit about R squared in terms of looking at some simulations. So I'm going to start out by coming right here. 
I'm going to copy this. Essentially, what this is going to do, and I'll and I'll show you this in a, as as I do it. All right, let's see if this pastes in all right. All right, so let's come right here. First of all, I need to set up my parameters. I'm gonna just make some simple linear regressions. So I have a beta naught equals zero, a beta one equals one. So essentially, I'm gonna have an intercept of zero, and I'm gonna have a slope coefficient on my x variable of one. So the true um, function is just y equals x. All right, that's all it is. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add some noise to the data. I'm going to add some randomness to the data, and I'm going to add that randomness in various, you know, in various size. So here, this E1 is going to be noisy data, or four times noisier. All right, so the magnitude of these, um, these, this noise is going to be four times bigger, I guess, than um, is the second one. So for our first model, it's going to be my noisy model, lots of noise. My second one is going to be my less noisy model, not quite as much. Okay, and so all I'm going to do here is set some axes for both for my um, two graphs so that they look the same, and then I'm going to estimate these models. So let me go ahead. I'll run this. All right, that didn't do anything, and in here I'm just being fancy because I'm collecting my models together. So I have two models, and I put them in a list. We talked a little bit about lists before in a previous lecture. Um, it's not absolutely essential that you know what that is. So next, let's take a graphical view of what R squared is. We've talked about this, but let's actually try to draw a graph. All right, so we're going to do x or y1 versus x. Okay, we're going to use my my common limits that I've already set, and then I'm going to do an a. I'm going to do a b line, um, which is just the mean of my y's, and then another one that is my actual model. Don't you don't have to worry so much about all of this stuff, but when I get this plotted. I've got a scatter plot my, of my data of y versus x, and the red line is the average value for y, and the blue line is my first model of y, so using x to try to predict y. And we can see, hey, we're a little bit better. Y, I mean, definitely it's better, but how much closer will my guesses be on average to the real data if I use my if I use X, right? So my my regression model that I came up with, then they would be if I just picked this whatever this red line is, right? So the mean, just a little over 50. Whatever that is, that's my R squared. Okay. So what should R squared be? Well, R squared should be what it should be, and it depends upon how noisy the data is, right? So let's let's take a look at the the same function and let's compare um, a plot with more noise and less noise. So let's let's come back here and and here's what I'm going to do. I know what the true function is. Okay, the true function is this beta naught one so basically a slope of one with an intercept of zero that's what my red line is going to be so that's what this red line in here over here is that's what the true function is um a b this this model one so the blue line that's what the what we estimated it using the linear model and you can see hey they're pretty darn close to one another right so if i run this you know i get the same thing pretty darn close to one another so I'm not getting a bad estimate. I mean, the, my model is actually pretty good. All right, but but hold on for a second. Let's let's also come in here and let's type in summary. And actually, I'm going to use sum. That's the function from JTools, S-U-M-M. -M. And I'm going to talk about model. Boom, boom, 
one. And let's look at this real quick. Oh, it didn't like that. Model not found. Oh, it's models, not model. Forgive me. There we go. And so here again, there's my plot. And then here is the output. So we can put, here's the plot, here's the output. And notice what's my R squared. It's like 0.68, it's not bad. But here's the thing, what are my, my well, my intercept is like 0.36, but it's got a really, really high, or 3.66, but it's got a really, really high P value. So basically it's, it's insignificantly different from zero. And then my X is like almost one. So, you know, pretty good actually. So next, what are we going to do? Well, let's look at the same thing. All right. This is the same thing. It's just doing Y2. All right. So the, the second model. So model two. So what's the difference? This one has lower noise. All right. Remember that the noisiness of this data in Y1 is like f four times greater than the noisiness of the model for Y2. And we can see, look, they're, they're, they're much tighter. Right, they're right on there. But let's also let's also look at this. And in fact, I I put both models together here in just a second. Probably should have waited for that. We'll add in here some model two. And let's run that. And we can put these side by side, and again. Intercept looks better because it's closer to zero, but it still has a high p-value and is statistically insignificantly different from zero. So in both cases, essentially, we got an estimate of zero for the intercept, and we're like bang on one, right? And of course, it's significant um, because that's just testing is it significantly different from zero, and yeah, it is. But we got an R-squared of 0.97. Well, what's going on here? Is is this model better than model one? Not necessarily. Um, and in fact, we can use this command, export sums, and just give it the list of models. And it will put the output from the models really nicely put together. Um, and so, it's giving me warnings here. Don't worry about the red dots, the red stuff. Um, but, you know, boom, boom. So it's getting the slope on X right in both cases. In both cases, when we look at the, the plots, it's very, very close. The estimated line is very, very close to the actual true signal in the data. But r squared in the first model is 0.68 and r squared in the second model is 0.97 why because the model the 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 data for model one even though the underlying data generating process this underlying line the signal underlying relationship between y1 and x is the same this one's more noisy it has more noise in it and so we're going to have a lower r squared in fact, we want the lower R squared in this case because we're able to filter out the noise. If we had a higher R squared, we'd be picking up this noise and we'd have, we wouldn't be getting the true signal. All right, and that will sum it up for our discussion on regression.